topic of my talk today is living in the exile nation, overcoming second class citizenry. Um, this is uh, almost entirely going to be about my personal story, um, which I believe uh, you can see here. Just got a couple of things I want to show you. So for those of you who don't know, I am, Um, I am an author, filmmaker, journalist, somebody trying to get this thing to work right here. Um, there we go. Okay. okay. This is my book. Um, I wrote this with the assistance of Open Democracy and the Ted Book Trust. And subsequent to this book that I wrote, I created the Exile Nation Project, which is the oral history documentary of the American War on Drugs and the American criminal justice system. Um, my story begins um, when I was uh, just getting out of college. Um, I was about 22 years old. And I came from uh, a family that was pretty rampant with substance abuse. And I was, you know, a little crazy. Um, I came from a very violent home. Um, and I suffered a, a great number of traumas throughout my young life. Um, for some reason, they decided to really concentrate themselves in my 22nd year. Um, I was just finishing school, and at the same time that I was finishing school, my family uh, disintegrated uh, before my very eyes. My father had a complete mental breakdown after bankrupting our family, and he kind of went nuts and left for a while. Um, my mother was left to take care of the other kids, and I was, uh, I woke up as a recent college graduate to realize that my father had never paid a dime for my education, had stolen, you know, tens of thousands of dollars from loan authorities, uh, credit cards and stuff, and saddled me with all of this debt. There was a terrible recession in 1992 in America, couldn't find a job, and <clears throat> I had also been battling some substance abuse throughout college. I'd been started with cocaine when I was about 19. Um, I started using again. Uh, and then within a very short period of time, I was assaulted on the street by a group of gay bashers. Um, when I was coming home from work at about three o'clock in the morning, I was um, bashed over the head with a block of concrete, which split open the back of my head. Um, I didn't know that they were gay bashers until the next day when I went to report it to the police and they told me that there was, this was a rampant problem in Boston at the time. Uh, and they were just, you know, roving bands of jocks that would go around looking for anyone they thought was homosexual and they would, you know, try to kill them. Um, they didn't kill me, but uh, less than two weeks later, I was coming home again at about three in the morning. I worked at a bar. It was the only job I could get. And a uh, car pulled up and someone called my name out of the car. And I noticed that it was a guy that I used to work with at a restaurant a number of years before. He was in a car with a group of guys. He asked what I was doing, told him that uh, I was coming home. He said, don't go home, come with us, we're going to a party. There's lots of coke there. That's all I needed to hear, I was in the car. Um, I get to the party and I realize that I'm the only straight male in the entire house and it's full of all of these gay men and they're looking at me very strangely. And um, they gave me some coke, they gave me a drink and that's the last thing I remember. I woke up the next morning to find that I had been gang raped all night, um, and it was pretty crazy. Um, I went into a kind of a state of shock, and I don't remember much of what happened. I remember I walked home miles, um, but that was really kind of what started my downward spiral. Um, I had been using cocaine, you know, fairly heavily at that time. Um, I had a supply. My supply disappeared. I started looking for it on the street. Second time I went to buy it on the street, someone brought me crack cocaine instead. That was really all it took. For the next 10 years, I battled a crack addiction. Um, for five years after I had this incident, I started this, uh, I received my first arrest uh, related to my drug use. Um, and what happened here was that I was really so out of control uh, I was, you know, I was engaged at the time. I was uh, thrown out of my house. I was living with some friends that uh, I worked in a theater with. And they could see that I was, you know, not well. 
and they didn't really want me around. They asked me to leave, and I was kind of bitter about that. Um, so I broke back into the house to get some things of mine and took some other things of theirs. They didn't take too kindly to that. Um, at the same time, I had ripped off my family, uh, my sister, my mother. I'd taken jewelry, I'd taken money, doing all the things that drug addicts have been known to do. Um, and I was on the loose. Uh, I disappeared into uh, some of the ghettos of Chicago. And so my mother went looking for me. And I can't even really believe that this happened, but she just happened to pull into this parking lot in a part of the city she'd probably never ever been to at the exact moment I was walking across this parking lot. So her and my sister chased me through the ghetto <laughs> in the car while I'm running. And a police officer saw it and they ran up and they you know, grabbed me, jumped out of the car, arrested me. My mother comes out screaming, oh, my son's on drugs, help, help, help. And you know, none of us had any real understanding of the police. Um, and so when I actually was arrested and taken into custody, the police said, um, we understand that you're a, a, a good kid, you just got a little turned around. Uh, our legal system isn't meant to you know, get people like you caught up. We're gonna get you help, we're gonna get you treatment. You just gotta tell us everything that happened so we know. So my mother says, tell them or I'll kill you. So I tell them everything. They say, thank you very much, stand up please. I stood up, they cuffed me. My mother said, what are you doing? I said, we're taking him to jail. She said, but you said that they would get treatment. And you were stupid enough to believe us. And that was the beginning of my first felony conviction. Uh, 18 months later, I relapsed and was caught again with possession of drugs. And um, by the grace of God, I managed to spend six months in a day report program at the Cook County Jail, where I taught GED classes to uh, these inner city kids, gangbangers mostly. Um, I was able to work my way through this program, and by the time I had to appear before the judge, the chief, the head of the program, one of the highest ranking officers in the Cook County system, went to court with me and begged the judge not to send me to prison. And the judge agreed with him and didn't. Um, I spent the next five years on probation. Uh, when I got off probation was when I stopped smoking crack, which was about 2001, shortly after 9-11. It was a life-changing experience for me. Um, I was just teetering on the edge of sanity to begin with, and the, the whole 9-11 experience completely shattered my reality, and um, I kind of went off the deep end, and when I came out of it, there was something in this voice in my head that just said, you know, this new world has no place for someone like you. Um, so, by hook or by crook, and by sheer will, um, I got away from my crack addiction. First I went into martial arts, and then I went full war into activism. I became, I was a drug war addict, I became a drug war offender, and then I became a drug war activist. And I joined a number of groups, and I started, in a very angry and kind of a disorganized sense, railing against the system. Um, I did not know this at the time. I also, by the way, I was a kind of a serial sexual abuse victim when I was a child. Uh, this is uh, so, uh, something that had been just a rep repeated motif in my life. And so I did not know that I was suffering from a pro pro pronounced and chronic form of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but as I kind of moved in and out of the activist world, became disillusioned as an activist, realized that I couldn't save the world, the world didn't really want to be saved, and Lord knows I wasn't the person to do it, um, I met it's people in the Chicago Burning Man community, and people that were connected to MAPS, and people that were connected to the psychedelic world. And they started talking to me about the benefits of psychedelic therapy, particularly MDMA and LSD for post-traumatic stress disorder. Now you have to understand, I had not touched psychedelics in 15 years. I was um, very much programmed against them. I believed all of the disinformation about them that ecstasy puts holes in your brain and LSD makes you crazy, and, and it was not something I was at all interested in. Uh, but, you know, circumstances have a way of changing one's opinion. 
And in mid-2004, I was in my car at 10.30 at night, driving home after getting some tums because I had a terrible ulcer problem at the time. And uh, the car in front of me slammed on its brakes and almost stopped and I almost plowed into it. And all these flashlights popped out of the car, the doors piled open, the next thing you know, I'm surrounded by four plainclothes tactical squad Chicago police officers who proceed to get, give, start giving me a lot of grief about riding their back end. Um, they order me out of the car and tell me that they're going to search the car and I refuse to get out. I told them that they needed probable cause to search my car and that this incident did not constitute probable cause because I had not committed any infractions. So they physically removed me from the car, cuffed me, searched me, and in the process of searching my car and searching me, they found flyers for an activist coalition I belonged to, the Chicago Coalition of Human Rights. And they found my membership to the Green Party, ACLU card, and all of this other liberal stuff that the police don't like very much. Well, at one point, one of the police says, oh, I think we got one of them holding up one of these flyers. At which point, the tone of the situation changed drastically. Um, the next thing I know, I'm being beat up by three of these police. I had my arm yanked out of the socket. I was dropped on my face, had a knee put into the back of my neck, and told that, uh, well, we'll see how much you guys like police brutality now. I didn't really understand what was going on until I was arrested and detained. I was uh, detained under a false charge of, being, of driving under the influence and of resisting arrest, both of which were completely false. Um, I later came to find out that there was uh, one of the members of our coalition was a group of Puerto Rican women, mothers, who had formed a group to fight against the brutality of a certain precinct. Uh, that had been sending their sons off to prison for crimes they did not commit because they needed bodies to go to prison. And this woman, Mae Molina, had found an eyewitness to a murder that her son had been uh, convicted for, that he did not commit. And just the week earlier had made an announcement that they were going to file this federal suit against the police, they had an eyewitness, and the police were very scared. When they found out that I was connected to this group, they decided to take it out on me. Right? So that experience exacerbated the trauma that I was experiencing in ways that I really can't begin to describe. I, was, um, I left Chicago and I went to San Francisco uh, to get away from that place and to, just to try to find something new. In San Francisco, I met somebody, um, I'll be honest, he was a supplier of psychedelics. Um, he was a very kind and gentle man, and him and his girlfriend talked me into trying MDMA for the first time in many years. Um, I took it, and it was almost a miraculous effect on me. Um, I you know, just kind of unloaded my entire life story to them. Uh, a week later was New Year's Eve, and he gave me some LSD, and I was very, very reluctant to take it. I thought I'd go nuts. I thought they'd like have a basket case on their hands, and it turned out to actually be an incredibly beneficial experience. And I felt the healing begin in me at that point. Um, two weeks later, he offered me DMT in liquid form in an intramuscular shot into my butt. And uh, let's just say that that completely changed my reality in every way that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> Um, at that point, I kind of became like a white-robed evangelist for psychedelics. And I was, you know, proselytizing from the mountain to everybody, you know, about these miracle medicines. Um, then I get a call from my lawyer. Uh, you have to come back and testify in this case. I put this off long enough. I go back home. I testify in this case. I tell my story. The part I didn't really get into is that they're, it's very complicated, but at the exact, the day before I was beat up by the police, there was a huge press conference to announce that a white supremacist named Matt Hale, who had been denied a law license in Illinois on the grounds of his political beliefs, um, and in response, one of his acolytes had gone out and killed about 17 people in Chicago in 1999. Um, they were, um, 
Uh, boy, I'm never going to get through this story. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, what happened was is that they make falsified this report that I was, you know, some kind of crazy right wing white supremacist screaming about killing judges because this guy had gotten caught hiring his bodyguard to kill his judge, who was in a federal uh, trademark case with another church called World Church of the Creator that didn't want a white supremacist church using their name. The judge ruled against this church, and, they, and so in turn, Matt Hale tried to have the judge killed. And somehow these cops thought that if they like put in this police report that I was supporting this guy and I was kind of like ranting these slogans that no judge would give me the time of day, they were wrong. The judge ruled in my favor. And I made the stupid mistake as I was walking out of the courtroom with my lawyer saying, well, I think a civil rights case just landed in our lap. And there was the police that, was, that had busted me listening to every word. Um, for the next three weeks, they camped outside my house. They followed me everywhere. And um, again, I'm in this white robe evangelist phase, and they busted me with uh, 11 pills of MDMA, and I went off to prison for a year. Um, when I got out of prison, uh, I was alienated from everyone I knew. People wouldn't talk to me. I couldn't get work. I couldn't find anyone to be sympathetic to my situation. I was stocking food at Trader Joe's uh, on the graveyard shift, which, as you know, my name is Charles Shaw. So uh, Two Buck Chuck is like the prime you know, product at Trader Joe's. And so basically, the absurdity of me stocking my own name every night drove me into a depression that I almost did not pull out of. I became suicidal within four months. And I was going to kill myself on New Year's Eve 2005. And um, on, the, on a whim at the last minute, I was invited to a party. I went to this party. There was a woman there that I had met only once the day I got out of prison. She was a fellow activist. Something told me to just tell her my story. In this story, she told me, um, well, have you heard of this thing called ayahuasca? Um, there's a group of us that are going to be doing this in two weeks. I think it can help you. If you'd like, I can get you into this circle. Um, I hung on for two weeks, I went and had what is known as the proverbial death rebirth experience. Um, it changed my life and I was reborn on that day, January 15, 2006. Uh, the next five years of my life were about making sense of everything that had happened to me and crawling out along this healing path. Now before I go, and if you can just give me one extra minute, I'd appreciate it. The point I really wanted to make about second class citizenry is that I am uh, a unique example. I am like in, a, in barely the one percentile that was able to overcome all of this because I had the benefits of education, I had proper class uh, growing up, I had resources, I had the ability to be articulate and creative. But there are 13 million Americans that have felony convictions. There are 65 million Americans, that's more than 20% of the population, who cannot pass a background check. In America, we all have to have background checks for every job, for everything. So since my first conviction, I have not been able to operate within the legitimate economy. I survive now because a UK foundation funds my work, funds my life. I can't get work in the United States because I'm a felon. I'm a multiple felon, I'm an ex-con. I live in what's, what I call the exile nation, which is a kind of form of internal exile where millions and millions of Americans are completely disenfranchised from their own culture. They cannot access the benefits of the culture. They cannot advance themselves. In the United States, you can't even get a loan to go to school if you have had a drug charge. You can murder somebody and get public housing and educational loans and grants. But if you have a drug charge, you can't get any public aid or assistance or education. There is no way to advance yourself unless you are creative and you can find a way around it. Um, I have dedicated now my life to trying to right this wrong and trying to uh, re, uh, reinstate the dignity of all of these people. It is my personal belief that drug offenders are political prisoners. I know that's a stretch for some people to understand, but when you understand where the drug war came from, that it was originally created to dismantle the black nationalists and anti-war movements of the 1970s, and then has since been used to denude the black culture from a revolutionary point at the end of the late 70s to a point now where uh, three generations of males has essentially been wiped out. Um, what you have is a political strategy. Um, 
I just came from the Burning Man Festival. I would love to talk to you people about what that's like when the counterculture and the police meet, but I'm running out of time. But uh, there's a lot in this particular construct um, where uh, it's like shooting fish in a barrel because you take the counterculture, you put them in one place, you surround them, you comb through them and charge every single one of them uh, with possession, except that you don't cart them off and give them a felony, you give them a $5,000 fine instead. So the state of Nevada makes you know, 50, 60 million dollars a year on the festival just from ticketing drug users. Uh, like I said, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, so I, I've really run out of time. I'm sorry that uh, uh, I didn't get into some of the more fine points of this, but um, during the q and I'd be more than happy to answer questions and kind of fill out the picture more for you. So thank you very much. Thank you.